knowing that, that, that you would have, a, have an end time in, in uh, incarceration. Can, can you talk a little bit about the, 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 the distinct challenges, the distinct difficulties that someone in that situation who now, given these Supreme Court rulings, is facing, if nothing else, a, a glimmer of possibility, a glimmer of hope that they may, in fact, lead some years of their life outside of, outside of a prison when before they had no, no hope, no inkling that that would ever be the case. So, uh, what, what, what do you think that, that, that does to an individual in that situation in terms of their thought process and mindset? Well, of course I'd like to say that you have to look at the incredible power of a person who has a juvenile life sentence or has a life sentence, and yet they continue to work on themselves. They continue to, to um, embrace that transformation even without the realization that it's going to be ending. You know, what I did, people think it's incredible, but as you said, I had a future release date that I could say 16 years from now or 15, 14, I could count it down. For a person to maintain that speaks to who they are as a person speaks to the real character. And in my mentoring, I was the beneficiary of federal lifers who were never going home. But their thought process was, I can't go home, but I'm going to instruct and help folks who are going home so that they can make a better place. And they were intent on creating a better environment. So many juvenile lifers and lifers in general are the nucleus of all the positive things that goes on inside a prison. Because the prison is a world, it's a society within itself. But it has to be run, it has to be organized, it has to be structured so that men and women can live inside of that environment and still have some sort of life. So you will find that folks with a life sentence have a greater investment in creating a good world for themselves because they have to live there. And they have the prospect of living their entire life there. So now for them to have put in all that work and be rewarded by the Supreme Court saying that this un was unconstitutional and you'll be given a chance to move forward, one, it's an incredible opportunity for them, it's a blessing for them and their family, but it's a vindication of justice. This is truly what justice is about. And this is what redemption is about. That You've never given up hope. And not just juvenile lifers, we have 5,000 men and women who are serving the life in the state of Pennsylvania. This is a rare hope for them, that what, ha that what has happened to the juvenile lifers, that there may be bills, there may be laws that would look at the juvenile life situation. This is why juvenile lifers are coming home, transitioning, and being as successful is so vitally important because it may lay the foundation for ordinary lifers to attain that same sort of status. For legislators to look at the juvenile lifers transition and say it's possible for people to move forward, to come home, to reassemble themselves in a society and be successful and contribute to society. So this is a social experiment that has to be successful on so many levels. For these men and women who went in as juveniles, never lived an adult life on the street, finally have an opportunity to live what we take for granted, to build adult relationships, to find a job, to support themselves, to go to school. And many of them are at the last stages of life. Uh, Joe Legon, who's been in 63 years, went in at 15, now he's 78. How much time does he have left? But those years he has left can be beneficial. He can be an example. And it runs the, the gamut of, uh, he's the oldest, but many are much younger. And they literally have 30, 40, 50 years of productivity that they can engage in here in society. So it's important for them to do well, 
it's important for all of the agencies that are tasked with their transition to work in harmony to create situations where there's no one person who uh, does a another murder or has a um, domestic situation that blows up in the media or do anything that will endanger those who are coming before because this is going to be a two or three year process where folks are going to be steadily coming to court they're trying to get released and move forward if there are situations that can destroy the process early in the process it'll be derailed we were just at the innocence project and um one of the lawyers there who goes into the DOC regularly and speaks to lifers groups said at one of the lifers meetings it was said can the lifers have a say in who goes out first because they know who's going to be successful and who's not going to be and I found that incredibly powerful and that's the reality when you live for years inside of a prison with someone you know that there's nowhere to hide you know, the mask that you wear in society of being a lawyer or being a, 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 um, a gangster or being you know, a, a successful businessman, all those masks are gone. All you have in prison is the force of your personality and your true character. So those who are inside know who you are. So who best to say the order of transition to court than the lifers who are there every day? I think that's incredible. That's amazing, and, and that seems like a radical concept to actually give uh, to to give prisoners a say in the in, in the in the parole and release process of their of their fellow inmates. I mean, it, it seems like that, it seems like that could be a tremendously empowering thing for um, uh, for people who are in that situation, just to be given a voice and a vote on yes. on anything. Um, you, you, had, you had mentioned something that, that, uh, that, that struck me as somewhat ironic and, and that had, had not occurred to me at all. And that's the distinction that you made for a number of years for a, for a finite sentence versus those who are, who are sentenced to life and that, and, and that lifers often, given the fact that they don't expect to be, uh, to be released ever, they say, this is my world now and I'm going to make the best of it. I'm going to, I'm going to make it as livable a situation as I possibly can where there may be some individuals who are serving a, a sentence of years who, are, who simply count time and, and whether or not they grow or progress over that course of years, they know when that number of years has expired, they're going to, they're going to leave, um, whether they're ready for it or not. My, my assumption was that the prospect of, of, of leaving the system would be harder for those who, who never expected that that would happen as opposed to those who, who knew that at some point their, their sentence would end and that they, they would be released. But, but what, you, what I'm sort of inferring from what you're saying is that it may be in some cases be, you know, be, be the lifers who have actually tried to, is, is nothing less than a survival mechanism, make the most of their experience who may be better equipped um, you know, in the event that as may be happening now, they, they are released. Do you think there's some, 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 some truth to that or am I no, most definitely. overgeneralizing? No. I think that that so many of these lifers, even though they have reconciled themselves to living in that environment, they've never given up hope. I mean, even with my finite sense, I've come to the hope that the laws would change and I would do less time. It didn't happen, but, but that was a dream. So people who are doing life always want to believe that at some point in time, something will happen that will, a ruling, a law, um, a break in the case, you know, that's why lifers spend literally years in a law library, mm -hmm. you know, looking for holes in the case, looking for, to, to claw their way back to freedom. So they are probably better equipped for freedom. When I went up to um, Graterford and we talked to about 55 juvenile lifers, and look at the, the um, youth sentencing program and also growing initiative. And they brought us in to talk about reentry. But what I'm finding as I go into the prisons and I, and I talk to juvenile lifers, 
They're ready to come home. They've been preparing in their own way to come home for many years. And they're going to do well. All they need is a support system to help them through the obstacles that any returning citizen encounters. But in my mind, I think that the juvenile lifers are going to be a vanguard of a new kind of prisoner coming out, and they're going to be leaders in the struggle against mass incarceration, in the struggle for social injustice, because they've been in the furnace so long. I mean, they're hard, they're warriors. And I welcome seeing them come out. I hope that many of them will come out and work with TCRC and other organizations and bring their unique experience to our struggle. So in regards to, the, to that unique experience, are, would you or have you tailored the services that, that TCRC provides to returning citizens uh, to meet any particular needs, if there are any particular needs or challenges that, that returning juvenile lifers might face? Well, what we do at the Center for Returning Citizens is we try to tailor our services to each individual. Everyone coming home needs something different. You know, yes, we all need housing, you know, we need a job, you know, we need stability. But each person's life is different and special. So I think where the Center for Returning Citizens does its best work is listening and then trying to tailor what we do for that individual that would best help them to move forward. Some people have more problems assimilating in terms of their family, you know, family reintegration. Um, some, it's, it's the employment end. Um, others, it's just socially being overwhelmed by the difference in the environment that they've left and the environment that they're coming into. Others are totally comfortable, but they just need a, a connection to what they want to do. You know, they need to know how to do certain things. And once they get that instruction, they're off and running. So since we tailor our services individually, the juvenile life are not going to be any different. Okay. You know, they would just need more in different areas depending on what they think they need. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you listen to a person, and, and we help folks to create a life plan, because so many people have never really sat down and say, what do I want to be in two years, five years, eight years, 10 years? You know, short-term planning and long-term strategic planning has not been our strong suit. We wouldn't be in the situation that we find ourselves. As so we help in that sense, so much help to clarify a vision and then move it forward. I, I, I apologize if your, if your website indicates this. I, 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 I tried to scour, but I, I might have missed this. How, how many returning citizens does the center uh, interact with each year, into, uh, new, newly released citizens? I, I would say. In a year, probably three to four hundred. Three to four hundred. Yeah. Per year. We've been in existence since 2012, and I say that we've probably helped 1,200 to 1,500 people in many different ways. Um, some people are very motivated, you know, and they come in, they apply, they go through the application process. We help them craft a new resume. We um, um, give them to training, they may take advantage of some aspects of our services, and they're off and running. And you never hear from them again unless they uh, maybe lose a job and they'll come back for another job, or they may, you know, want to use our office for something. But some people we help, and that's the extent of what they need. You know, other people are uh, more needy, and they uh, come back for different reasons, or we may refer them to different. Um, we do a lot of referrals to different things. Um, TCRC can't be all things, all people, but we can link them with whatever they need to move them forward. So it's been a it's been a powerful learning experience for us, you know, you know, yeah. as to how we can help people to move their lives forward. Do you, do you find that um, that the successful return citizens, the, the you know the, the, the folks you who you describe, I guess, as sort of being a best case scenario, they come in, they you know they, they acquire specific tools from you put them to use and do well, you know, get employment, housing, you know, form or reform, good social relationships. Um, do, do you see any kind of organic uh, networks and support groups arising? I mean, you, you've, you know, you've taken your experience 
formalized it through the TCRC and has you know, been a, 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 a huge resource. But you find that you know, your, the, the alumni of the TCRC are, are reaching back out to, you know, to, to, to help out recently returned citizens. You, is there a, a yes, community? I guess that's what I'm saying, yeah. is there a community? Well, we're trying to build a community. Um, I think that um, some of our returning citizens are involved with other groups across the city because one of the things that we advocate is the community service. We believe that you need to atone for what you've done in the past and to help to build a community. Um, one of the foundation stones of my training with Dr. Mitchell Shakur was we have to build our community and we have to atone for what we've done in the past. And if you sold drugs, if you murdered or done any sort of crime, the ripples of what you did spread out through the community. When you sell drugs, you literally affect thousands of people, and you may not see it, but it's there. And so it's our responsibility to rebuild community. And that's one of the, the principles that we try to instill in folks as they come into our office. And it can be in small ways. It can be um, mentoring a kid down the block, or, or um, we advocate a spiritual center. You know, um, it doesn't matter what you believe in, but believe in something. You know, so when we turn citizen, rejoins their church or their mosque or a neighbor organization. That's building a network. And we, we often see people calling saying, um, I just got a job here and they're hiring or um, I'm in this organization. Um, do you folks want to come and work with us? We're very big in voter registration and in other activities in the community, anti-violence, um, at-risk youth. So I see TCRC alumni in so many areas of Philadelphia, and I anticipate that that will continue to spread. Um, we form what we call the Block Party. It stands for Build, Lobby, Organize a Campaign. And that's a movement to unite the 300,000 plus returning citizens in Philadelphia into a social, political, and cultural movement. And that's important. Because if there's 300,000 of us in this city, we should be running the political side of Philadelphia. But we're not organized on that level yet. But it's a strategic goal uh, to get to. It's, I, I mean, it, it sounds ambitious, but it sounds eminently feasible. It seems like it could be done. And, and to have a, have a block like that is... is it just needs funding and, and, um, and organization. And right. just yesterday we talked to a... Uh, organizer for the um, Hillary campaign from DC, and they're very interested in what we're doing. That's, right. that's, a, uh, that's something we are, in fact, we're gonna be um, having a meeting later on today. Great, 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 that's, that's, that's great to hear. Um, well, listen, I, I wanna thank you for, for your time and thoughts. This has been very helpful to me. Um, I'm gonna be putting together uh, this article in, in the next few days. I'm not sure yet where it'll be published at the least. Uh, I think it'll show up in the Philadelphia Citizen, which is a relatively new online uh, publication, which I can um, I can send you the link to if it ends up there. I'd, I'd like to, to get it somewhere that has a somewhat wider readership, um, but in any case, I will I will let you know uh, where it ends up. And you send us a link. We'll put it on Twitter and, and uh, Facebook and you know different blogs. Shoot it out there. Right. Well, I, so I'm I'm not an objective reporter here. I I am interested in in creating awareness of of, of the work that. You guys do with your organization because I think it's I think it's invaluable. I mean, I, I've I've been in Philadelphia for nine years now. Um, I have a family here, and this is where I expect to raise my kid. And you know, I, I think it's important to um, to make Philadelphia as, as 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 good a city as it can be for for all of our citizens. And I, I think that you guys are doing incredibly important work to that end. Um, I also hope to be assigned to a new juvenile life or case, so my goal will be to get this done and out the door before we buckle back down into that. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be somebody who appreciates you. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to be, uh, need to be appreciated, I, but I just want to be able to, to help, work, whether, it's, right. whether it's appreciated or not. Um, so with that said, I'll, uh, I'll take you guys back down now. If, if anything comes up, um, anything that you want to add to this discussion in the coming days, uh, you know, you've got my phone number, you've got my, my email, I'll give you my card just so you have it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
hoping that we are doing that uh, you may be able to assist with. Um, um, you do real estate, but um, we're we're doing um, two projects. We're um, doing a project down in, in um, off of Germantown Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to put together a a um, ready terminal type farmers market okay, sure. with a um, vocational educational. Uh -huh. Let's touch base on that at some point. Um, yeah, you can be involved in that. Yeah, I'd be interested in that for sure. You know, frankly, it's a hundred million dollar project. You know, and we are, you know, we have the concept. You know, we um, have done a lot of the architectural groundwork. Miguel or Harvey, you ever heard? Heard of them? I have not. Putting together this um, real estate investment. Trust fund, mm -hmm. you know, so we can get folks to okay. you know, to invest in it. You know, but we need um, we're definitely going to need expertise in terms of of um, putting together. It's, it's it's a major thing. Um, we're um, uh, listening to support of uh, Cindy Bass, of course, because she's mm -hmm. our sure. yeah. our um, our district city council, but also we're you know Curtis Jones, yeah. you know, Kenyatta, you know, the folks who are really involved in, in uh, criminal justice. We're trying to get as many city council on board to move forward. So having, you know, uh, their work you know, acting on the corner might... might yeah, well, let's, 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 have a, let's have a further discussion about that. I'm not sure, you know, what, what our role could be, but uh, if nothing else, we could probably be a source of you know, referrals or contacts. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'd be happy to, happy to talk to you. I'll send you, uh, I'll send you the summary. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, I'd like to take a look. All right.